In this recording, we are to deal with the notion of order in society, picking up from ancient Greece and 16th century Spain as an example. The second idea that we'll deal with is ornamentation, establishing that it is the instrument by which order in society is implemented. Within this discussion, I am also going to specifically elaborate on graffiti and street art as ornaments. At the end of this recording, I'm flashing one question for you to answer in your free time whenever you can. Order is existing since society began. It is not to be taken as a perfect order, but we are partaking of a predisposed plan by authority for our community, as members of it and as part of its history. An example of predisposed order in the public space was the establishment of the concepts of policia and ornato in 16th century Spain. Used as verbs, the two terms mean to enforce order and to decorate, respectively. Enforcing order in 16th century Spain had often been through major infrastructure like a public square and a bridge. The building of a bridge, just like in any other city, served as an infrastructure that strengthened the spatial connectivity of Spain. At the same time, its ornato served to metaphoricalize the civility of a city. Another example of a deliberated order is the Agora. Agora is a central public space in ancient Greek city. The plan of order is believed to have shaped the potential for democracy in Agora because people were free to hold arguments in their public square. Their arguments are out in the open. They are debating within this public square. Andy Merrifield described the open plan of the public square, which had exposed columns, as confronting the society's issue in the light of day, in full face, with no hiding. In contrary, the closed temples and the ancient ziggurats evoked the opposite of this out-of-the-open participation in democracy, just for the sake of comparison. The active part that we, the citizens, participate in is ornamentation. If the society will look into it closely, it is habitual, it exists in subtlety, and it is used perpetually by the government. An example of ornamentation in ancient Greece is epigraphy. It predated the modern graffiti art and street art today. Currently, it is considered as ancillary. The epigraphy is considered as ancillary to ancient history. Epigraphy is usually painted or written on a material, either papyrus or various hard substances such as stone and bronze. These were attached to buildings for people to see and read. These pieces of writing inscribed for people are maintaining a standard to look up to. No less than the ancient Greek citizens were likely to read these inscriptions every day of their lives as they go to work or to their mundane activities. Here is a modern example of an epigraph from a Catholic institution installed with the objective of honing in the minds of students the motto of the school. To reprise, establishing order for control is done through ornamentation. The problem is not everyone likes control. If one would insist an order in the world of chaos, the order will sanitize the system to regain control. After all, the state is responsible for consolidating its citizens, to muster civility and to make sure everyone follows. A symbol of fear would be etched on public spaces to remind the citizens of the punishment and restrictions set by the authority. This is applicable to any institutions, including even religious institutions. 
In this presentation, ornament and order can sometimes be seen as two strange bedfellows. Because ornaments do not commit to the kind of order required by the state all of the time, it leaves us with an impression that polity could also be a strong influence in this order. There are some extraordinary times that order is forgotten, and there are numerous times that ornament was included in the planning of a great state. Graffiti art had come a long way past the authorities that apprehended it and the aesthetics and idealist movement that tried to drape a white cloth over the teeming fugly spray paints and stencils on public properties. There was a strange concept portrayed by Francis Terry, a British artist and architect whose graffiti work on a tunnel portended to look at ornament as connected to disornament or the lack of ornamentation by convincing graffiti artists through his works in the tunnel to look at a renewed approach to street art without sacrificing ethics and aesthetics. Graffiti and street art are under the same tradition of modern art. Let us review the definition of the two terms graffiti and street art in order not to draw confusions. Here's one written by Scott Decker and Glenn Curry. To quote, Graffiti, form of visual communication, usually illegal, involving the unauthorized marking of public space by an individual or group. Although the common image of graffiti is a stylistic symbol or phrase spray-painted on a wall by a member of a street gang, some graffiti is not gang-related. Graffiti can be understood as antisocial behavior performed in order to gain attention or as a form of thrill-seeking, but it also can be understood as an expressive art form. So this art was not necessarily originally within acceptable behavior, as you see, but it had developed into its own art form, but not overnight. It was a kind of developmental art, but an underground kind of art. Notice that Scott and Glenn used visual communication as relevant to graffiti. Now, it seems that Scott and Glenn asserted that graffiti is not random. Neither is street art. Personally, I think it could be anything between assertion of identity or claiming of a territory, the way most people commonly understand this behavior of spray painting. Here's a definition of street art from Stephanie Prezi Bialek. Street art is art created on surfaces in public places like exterior building walls, highway overpasses, and sidewalks. Street art tends to happen in urban areas, and yes, it's connected in certain ways to graffiti. Street art is usually created as a means to convey message connected to political ideas or social commentaries. Not all street art involves painting. It can be done with stickers spread over surfaces or by methods like yarn bombing, a process where artists cover things like trees and telephone poles with colorful fibers and knitting. Street art can also be done using stencils where the creator repeats the image all over a surface to make a statement. As viewed from Stephanie, street art is larger in scope and has multiple modes of expression compared to graffiti. Unlike graffiti, which focuses more on marking texts, street art focuses more on images. Before we continue, here's an example of yarn bombing in Banilad, Cebu City. The insight that we get from the comparison of the definitions is that the two ideas are closely related and only differ in terms of intent and permissibility. 
The former is unauthorized, while the latter is authorized. Based on historical studies, graffiti predates street art. Its counterculture is a huge part of its intent, while street art drew inspiration from graffiti in using more elaborate and extensive images. The bad boy image of graffiti has changed across the years. There are those who are interested to turn its upsetting of social order into a decent ornamental. Let's go back to order and ornament. The quick relationship that we can derive from order and ornament is that of adding something to an existing model. Order is the uh, original arrangement, while ornament is adding something to coexist with that order, similar to adding a frieze on the pediment of this Greek temple. Ornamentation, furthermore, is an expression of appreciation of man towards the creation of God, sealing a relationship that is considered as spiritual and mystical. In terms of cognitive impact, ornamentation is significantly seen as important by psychologists in cognitive development. The mind is being slowed down by the process of concentration involved in ornamentation, like putting into order the way we carry on with our thinking. It induces meditation. Sometimes it is hard to believe that graffitis and street art could be anything more than the microculture of gang groups and loiterers. And sometimes too, we are locked up in our own prejudice about a brand of art. Finally, we are taken up by the matter-of-fact statement of Edmund Leach as regards our brand of order. Here's a statement from Edmund Leach, an anthropologist which throws overboard the classical meaning of order. We are all criminals by instinct. It is part of our very nature. If we act in defiance of custom or reinterpret custom to suit our private convenience, we commit a crime. Yet all creativity, whether it is the work of the artist or the scholar or even of the politician, contains within it a deep rooted hostility to the system as it is. On that account, creativity is mad, it is criminal, but it is also divine. Human society would have died out long ago if it were not for the fact that there have always been inspired individuals who were prepared to break the rules. Graffiti and street artists are anonymous. This gives the ample freedom to express. The limitation of identifiability is the expectations of those who could come to know you and living up to that expectation. Sometimes names are like definitions that give boundaries. Apart from enjoying anonymity, these type of artists are increasingly creative, steady, and risk-taking. Because of anonymity, they are able to redefine their works and bid some more ideas into their work effortlessly. Images of graffiti and street art are borderline macabre or by all odds macabre. Images or figures of gaping mouth, nauseating man, decapitated dead, sometimes bare bodies, and cows oculars, visual nudity, sex, and etc. They are plastered across vacant walls of the city. Yet their creators are not customary to explaining their work to people. They are the most tacit of the breed of contemporary artists, yet they are bold and they are audacious in their social revelations. Though they don't shy away from the media, but consummate study of their work will be up to the viewing public. Here's an activity or habit of gang members again, and now not just limited to them, but also to self-proclaimed graffiti artists. 
It's called tagging. Tagging is leaving behind scores of symbols to represent a gang, a crew, or a person who does the tag. It can be done in stencil or spray paint. It had originated from the behavior of marking territories. It's a competition for dominance. This group of artists have their own sense of order and they find it cool to vandalize or make a neighborhood a canvas of their coolness. The lack of curation built up the unfavorable response of the public to graffiti art. They don't see in all clarity the relationship between city and spray paints on the wall. It is because of the widespread belief that art needs curation. Somebody to curate it. The graffiti and street art do not readily gain prominence because of the absence of curator. Some people are yet accustomed to celebrate art outside of the comforts of a gallery. They might look at graffiti art more favorably on a computer screen, but as a mobile audience in their car, to which the original work would intend to communicate the graffiti, well, the graffiti becomes an adjunct to the public space or the urban landscape. In the modern century, it was likely to ask whether ornamentation was still a relevant item in that period. For one, there was a claim that ornamentation is part of human psychological drive. But when humans built and designed this modern building, it was out of disengagement with ornaments, minimalist for that matter. If the architecture of the neoclassicism brought the sculptural adornments of the past, this visual adornment culture was momentarily replaced with minimalist buildings in the 19th century. Thus, we find buildings with no adjunct ornamentation devoid of a specific character. Ornamentation served an empty decorative effect in the modern period. It had questioned whether the compulsion towards ornamentation was indeed culturally or superficially honest. It was not only neoclassical ornament which necessitated expulsion in the modernist era. For Luz, a cultural critic, decorative form in its entirety was ripe for extinction in the modern era, representing backwardness or even degenerative tendency. Francis Terry painted a Trump loyal or visual deception of neoclassical arches in one part of Banksy's tunnel in London along Leak Street. It was an unexpected and subvertive idea against the backdrop of street art. It was like playing a classical music in a club. It shows how incongruous the two ideas can be. How can the visuals of neoclassical design forge an illusion of order in that tunnel? More properly, Terry did not polish the wall with neoclassical object, but he had hidden the details of the graffiti and street art formerly occupying that space, not with the idea of decorative excess, but with his illusion of order through an illusion of moral perfection. Terry was able to capture the wittiness of graffiti art while pursuing his neoclassical compulsion. It was intricately done. Usually most of the street graffitis and street art are a quick work, a breeze through for the lack of time considering it as an underground activity. Although not everyone may share in the intent of Terry to tap a little formality in order to a worn out part of the city by producing a decent subject, it was a radical agenda because no one but him and his crew and his followers had publicized the idea of subverting 
the subvertive graffitis and street art in that area. Terry had created a new ideal in the province of urban art. His outcome is aspirational for a model of citizenship, just like GPO's work shown here that features the iconic image of a colonnaded temple. Finally, graffiti and street artists see the urban world as a space and instrument where they can actively attack the schism between public and private through insurgent ornamentation. For example, the phenomenon of culture jamming. The locus of attack in culture jamming is consumerism. The, the production of graffiti works that culture jams an advertisement or any method of selling through posters and billboards is a sign that graffiti art is full of instrumentation and allows people to be reflective or express dismay or gratify themselves with the thought that they are shaping public opinion as well.